so today's story is another just so story by Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling and this one is how the leopard got his spots in the days when everybody started fair best beloved the leopard lived in a place called the high veld remember it wasn't the low veld or the bush veld or the sour veld but the exclusively bare hot shiny high veld where there was sand and sandy coloured rock and exclusively tuft, tufts of sandy yellowish grass. The giraffe and the zebra and the, the eland and the kudu and the hearty beast lived there and they were exclusively sandy yellow brownish all over. But the leopard, he was the exclusively sandiest yellowish brownish of them all. A greyish yellowish catty shaped kind of beast and he matched the exclusiveliest yellowish, greyish, brownish colour of the high veld to no hair. This was very bad for the giraffe and the zebra and the rest of them, for he would lie down by exclusive, exclusively yellowish, brownish, brown stone or a clump of grass. And when the giraffe or the zebra or the eland or the kudu or the book bush or the bronte buck came by, he would surprise them out of their jumps and lives. He would indeed. And also, there was an Ethiopian with bows and arrows. Exclusively greyish, brownish, yellowish man he was then, who lived on the high veld with the leopard. And they used to hunt together. The Ethiopian with his bows and arrows, and the leopard with his exclusively with his teeth and claws. Till the giraffe, and the eland, and the kudu, and the cougar, all the rest of them didn't know which way to jump, best beloved. They didn't indeed. After a long time, things lived forever so long in those days. They learnt to avoid anything that looked like a leopard or an Ethiopian. And bit by bit, the giraffe began it because his legs were the longest. They went away from the high veld. They scuttled for days and days till they came to a great forest, exclusively full of trees and bushes and stripy, speckly, patchy, blatchy shadows, and there they hid. And after another long time, what with standing half in the shade and half out of it, and what with the slippery, slidey shadows of the trees falling on them, the giraffe grew blotchy, and the zebra grew stripy, and the eland and the kudu grew darker, with little wavy lines on their backs, like bark on a tree trunk. And so, though you could hear them, and smell them. You could very seldom see them. And then, only when you knew precisely where to look. They had a beautiful time in the exclusively speckly, spikely shadows of the forest, while the leopard and the Ethiopian ran about over the exclusively greyish, yellowish, reddish high veld outside, wondering where all their breakfasts and their dinners and their teas had gone. At last, they were so hungry that they ate rats and beetles and rock rabbits, the leopard and the Ethiopian, and then they had the big tummy ache, both together. Then they made the, met Bavian, the dog-headed barking baboon, who is quite the wisest animal in all of South Africa. Said leopard to Bavian, and it was a very hot day, where has all the game gone? And Bavian winked, he knew said Barbian to the Ethiopian. Can you tell the present habitat of the Aboriginal fauna? That meant the same thing, but the Ethiopian always used long words. He was a grown-up. Barbian winked, he knew. Then said Barbian, the game has gone into other spots, and my advice to you, leopard, is to go into other spots as soon as you can. And the Ethiopian said, well, that is all very fine, but I wish to know whether the Aboriginal fauna has migrated. Then said Barbian, the Aboriginal fauna has joined the Aboriginal flora, because it was high time for a change. And my advice to you, Ethiopian, is to change as soon as you can. That puzzled the leopard and the Ethiopian, but they set out to look for the Aboriginal flora. And presently, after so many days, they saw a great high tall forest full of tree trunks, all exclusively speckled and spottled and spottled and dotted 
and slashed and slashed and hatched and cross-hatched with shadows. Say that quickly aloud and you will see how every very shadow the forest must have been. What is this, said the leopard, that is so exclusively dark and yet full of little pieces of light? I don't know, said the Ethiopian, but it ought to be the great Aboriginal flora. I can smell giraffe and I can hear giraffe, but I cannot see giraffe. That is very curious, said the leopard. I suppose it is because we have just come in and out of the sunshine. I can smell zebra and I can hear zebra, but I cannot see zebra. Wait a bit, said the Ethiopian. It's been a long time since we've hunted them. Perhaps we've forgotten what they were like. Fiddle, said the leopard. I remember them perfectly on the high veldt, especially their marrow bones. Giraffe is about 17 feet high, of exclusively fulvous golden yellow from head to heel, and zebra is about four and a half feet high, of exclusively grey fawn colour from head to heel. Um, said Ethiopian, looking for, into the speckly, speckly shadows of the Aboriginal flora, flora forest. Then they ought to show up in this dark place like ripe bananas in a smokehouse. But they didn't. The leopard and the Ethiopian hunted all day, and though they could smell them, and they could hear them, they never saw one of them. For goodness sake, said the leopard at tea time, let us wait till it gets dark. This daylight hunting is a perfect scandal. So they waited till dark, and then the leopard heard something breathing stiffly in the starlight that fell off stripy through the branches, and he jumped at the noise, for it smelt like zebra, and it felt like zebra. But when he knocked it down, it also kicked like zebra, but he could not see it. So he said, be quiet, oh you person without any form. I am going to sit on your head until morning, because there is something about you I do not understand. Presently, he heard a grunt and a crash and a scramble, and the Ethiopian called out, I've caught a thing that I can't see. It smells like giraffe, and it kicks like giraffe, but it does not have any form. Don't you trust it, said the leopard. Sit on its head until the morning, same as me. They have not any form, any of them. So they sat down on them hard until bright morning, and then leopard said, What have you at your end of the table, brother? The Ethiopian scratched his head and said, It ought to be exclusively rich, fulvous, orange, tawny from brown to head to heel, and it ought to be giraffe, but is covered all over with chestnut blotches. What have you at your end of the table, brother? And the leopard scratched his head and said, It ought to be exclusively delicate greyish fawn, and it ought to be zebra, but is covered all over with black and purple stripes. What in the world have you been doing to yourself, Zebra? Don't you know that if you were on the high veldt I would see you ten miles off? You haven't any form. Yes, said Zebra, but this is not the high veldt. Can't you see? I can now, said the leopard, but I couldn't all of yesterday. How is this done? Let us up, said the Zebra, and we will show you. They let the Zebra and the giraffe get up, and Zebra moved away some little thorn bushes where the sunlight fell all stripy, and Zebra moved off to some tallish trees where the shadows fell all blotchy. Now watch, said the Zebra and the Giraffe. This is the way it's done. One, two, three, and where's your breakfast? Leopard stared, and the Ethiopian stared, but all they could see was stripy shadows and blotched shadows. They had just walked off and hidden themselves in the shadowy forest. Hey, hey, said the Ethiopian, that's a trick worth learning. Take a lesson by it, leopard. You show up in this dark place like a bar of soap in a coal scuttle. Ho, ho, said the leopard, would it surprise you very much to know that you show up in this dark place like a mustard platter like on a sack of coals? Well, calling names won't catch dinner, said the Ethiopian. The long and the little of it is that we don't match on our backgrounds. I'm going to take B B Babian's advice. He told me I ought to change. And as I've nothing to change but my skin, I'm going to change that. What to? said the leopard, tremendously excited. To a nice working blackish-brownish colour, with a little purple in it and touches of slaty blue. 
it will be the very thing for hiding in hollows and behind trees. So he changed his skin there and then, and the leopard was more excited than ever. He had never seen a man change his skin before. But what about me, he said, when the Ethiopian had worked his last little finger into his fine new black skin. You take Fabian's advice too. He told you to go into some spots. So I did, said the leopard. I went into other spots as fast as I could. I went into this spot with you, and a lot of good it's done me. Oh, said the Ethiopian. Fabian didn't mean spots like in South Africa. He meant spots on your skin. What's the use of that, said the leopard. Think of giraffe, said the Ethiopian. Or if you prefer stripes, think of zebra. They find their spots and stripes give them perfect satisfaction. Hmm, said the leopard. I wouldn't look like zebra. Not for ever so. Well, make up your mind, said the Ethiopian, because I'd hate to go hunting without you. But I must if you insist on looking like a sunflower against a tarred fence. I'll take spots then, said the leopard, but don't make them too vulgar big. I wouldn't like, like to look like giraffe. Not for ever so. I'll make them with the tips of my fingers, said the Ethiopian. There's plenty of black left on my skin still. Stand over. Then the Ethiopian put his five fingers close together. There was plenty of black left on his new skin still. And pressed them all over the leopard. And wherever the five fingers touched, they left f five little black marks all close together. You can see them on any leopard skin you like best, beloved. Sometimes the fingers slipped and the marks got a little blurred. But if you look closely at any leopard now, you'll see that there are always five spots of five fat black fingertips. Now you are a beauty, said the Ethiopian. You can lie out on the bare ground and look like a heap of pebbles. You can look, lie out on the naked rocks and look like a piece of pud pudding stone. You can lie out on a leafy branch and look like sunshine sifting through the leaves. And you can lie right across the centre of a path and look like nothing in particular. Think of that and purr. But if I'm all this, said the leopard, why don't you go spotty too? Oh, plain black's best for me, said the Ethiopian. Now come along and we'll see if we can't get even with Mr. One, two, three, where's your breakfast? So they went away and lived happily ever after, best beloved. That is all. And now, and, and now and then you will hear grown-ups say, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? I don't think even grown-ups will keep saying such a silly thing if the leopard and the Ethiopian hadn't done it once, do you? But they will never again do it, best beloved. They are very contented as they are. There are some words I changed in this story because of modern values. Personally, I love the story as it is. However, due to where I'm publishing it, I did change some words. I still love the story and there is nothing racist in my view because Rudyard Kipling wrote it before anything was considered racist. I hope you enjoyed the story and don't hold it against me.